the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 11, or 12, we're going to be looking at Hebrews 11 before we go into chapter 12, but Hebrews chapter number 12 is where we're going to be this evening. I would love for us to look at this together. And it's kind of hard for me just to jump in to the middle of a book. I don't get the privilege of preaching through the whole book. And so I would love to try to bring you up to speed, bring us up to speed as to what's going on in the book of Hebrews. I'm actually reading through the book of Hebrews right now. And um, it's just kind of on my mind and on my heart. And the, the book of Hebrews is written to some Christians who are struggling. They're going through persecution. you got some Christians who, they have forsaken everything. I mean, folks, in a, in a time of persecution, you're forsaking everything in order to become a follower of Christ. But they believed and they had faith. But then you know what happened? Is they actually have gone through a, a season of persecution. And these, I mean, it was hard. And some of these Christians are kind of scratching their heads going, man, I believe, but this is hard. You know, there's actually some Christians here that, that this book is being written to that it seems like they're being challenged because they're kind of wondering, is this really worth it? Have you ever found yourself going through a season of doubt? Going through a season of discouragement? Um, now, true believers, you know what they're going to do? They're going to persevere because Jesus Christ, just like we sang a minute ago, He's going to hold us fast. We're going to make it. Not because we're awesome, but because He's awesome. But what the, what the author of the book of Hebrews does, and the reason why he does it is because we know in the timeline of early church history, we know that they've been through one season of persecution and it's sort of subsided and right during that time where it's subsided is when this book is written to them. But we actually know, they don't, but we do, they're actually getting ready to go through an even bigger persecution. And so what the author of Hebrews does is he comes to them with this circular argumentation where he's, where he's actually coming to them making the point that yes indeed this Jesus is worth it no matter how bad the persecution gets he's worth it you know why? because he's better than everything he goes all through he starts off in chapter number one talking about how Jesus is better than the angels God had used angels, his messengers, to speak to his people. He said in times past, we've listened to God as he's spoken to us through his angels, but now he's spoken to us through his son. And Jesus is better than the angels. He continues on talking about how Jesus is better than Moses. And what Jesus has brought to us is better than Moses. And how Jesus is better than the, the whole priestly system. Jesus is a better high priest. Jesus Christ has brought a better offering himself one time he laid down his life and there's no need for any more sacrifices the the priceless perfect lamb of god has been slain jesus christ is a better priest he's a better offering he has brought a better covenant over and over and over again this book just keeps coming back no nope. He is worth it because Jesus Christ is better. And you've got to believe it. And then you know what he does in chapter number 11? You know this great chapter. He talks through to these believers. He's talking through their history, their Hebrew history, about those who by faith believed. He starts with Enoch and he talks about Abraham and he talks about Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and all of these who by faith, what does it say? By faith, they believed, they grabbed a hold of the promises of God even though they couldn't understand. I mean, they were told to do crazy things. Noah, go build a boat. It's going gonna, it's gonna to flood. It's going to rain. 
Folks, it's crazy. A boat? It's going to do what? I, Abraham, pack up and leave Ur the Chaldees. Where am I going? I'll tell you later. Pack it up. How would you like for your husband to come tell you that? Where are we going, baby? I don't know. Pack it up. We're leaving. By faith, these men did amazing things. Why? Because they believed the promises of God. Can I tell you something about faith? It's not easy. Would you look at chapter number 11, verse 1? We're going to get to chapter 12. But chapter 11, verse 1, what does it say? It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Can I tell you something about that definition? That's kind of a Bible definition of faith. It's the substance of things hoped for. What? That's not substantial. Things you're hoping. Substance means I can touch it. I can feel it. I can feel this. I can touch it. I can see it. If I wanted to, I can taste it. This, there's substance here. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You can't exactly put your hands on that. It's the evidence of things you can't see. What kind of evidence is that? I mean, by very definition, faith is not easy. I never forget a friend of mine. His name is Bob Roberts. Bob Roberts started a children's man. He's a children's evangelist. Goes all around the world preaching to children. He's six foot seven. Um, we call him. We call him Big Bob. And he's a passionate guy. He, he wrote a children's curriculum called Kids for Truth. It's used in churches all around the country. And he was speaking at a camp that I was working at. And um, at one particular, I was actually working on the teen side. And he was preaching to the children. And Bob finds me. He said, hey, you got time to pray? He said, man, we are just, I'm telling you, there are some kids here who are just, they're not saved. They're hard in their hearts. And I'm just praying that God will, will, will break through. So we get together. And I remember, I remember me and Bob, we're on our knees and we're praying. And I mean, Bob's a big guy. He's passionate. You ever been praying? got your eyes closed but you can just kind of almost see and feel motion going on I remember Bob was just pouring his heart out to God that he would work in the hearts and lives of these kids and I kind of picked up and Bob's got his hands raised up he's just like God would you please work and then he started to pray for faith he said God I'm just such a doubter I remember him praying he said God I'm just such a doubter I just I just I have so much unbelief in my heart would you forgive me would you help me to have faith that you're going to work and then, and then just right in the middle of his prayer, he's just being so passionate. All of a sudden, right in the middle of his prayer, I've got my eyes closed and I'm just praying earnestly. And Bob goes, just right in the middle of his prayer, he says, God, sometimes faith stinks. I remember I was praying, I went. And then he followed his statement and he said this, God, I can't wait till I get to heaven. And I don't need faith anymore. Now, what did he mean by that? First of all, I know Bob, and faith doesn't stink. Faith is awesome. Faith is the God-given currency for me and you to make it through this life. But I know what he meant when he said, sometimes faith stinks, and I can't wait till I get to heaven, and I won't need faith anymore. Why did my friend Big Bob say that when he gets to heaven, he's not going to need faith anymore? Somebody tell me why. Wait a sec, what? Like with real eyes, we're going to be able to see him. Can you see him right now? All we can see this world. We can see everything to spend our money on. We can see all the things to throw our lusts at, our desires. We can see all the, we can feel all the opportunities to be bitter. We can see all the opportunities to be immoral. This world is in vivid color. And you can touch it, see it, feel it. But if we're going to be people who see Jesus right now, you've got to do it through eyes of faith. And it's not easy. And the day's going to come where we don't need faith anymore because we're going to see him face to face. In the meantime, we are people who walk by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, as the author of Hebrews is talking to these people, have they gone through one season of persecution, it's subsided, but a bigger one's coming. 
He says, you've got to, we've got to be people who live by faith. And he says, look at your history. Look at your Hebrew history. Look at all these people who by faith, by faith, they did amazing things. And listen what he says about them. Look at Hebrews chapter number 11. Look at verse 13. He says, all these, these all died in faith. Not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What does he say? He says all of these who've gone before you who lived this life of faith that he mentions in this great hall of faith in chapter 11 as he's using as an example for these believers now as he's getting ready to move into chapter 12 where we're going. He says, he said all of these have gone before you and they never even received the promises they were holding on to. But he said they saw them and they grabbed a hold of them and they said this about themselves. They said, we're just pilgrims passing through this land. You know what pilgrims are? Pilgrims are people who aren't quite home yet. Folks, we're not home, I'm sure that Troy, Missouri is an awesome place. But I got news for you. You're heading somewhere far better than this. And so what he does is he uses in chapter 11 the picture of a pilgrimage. These saints, these great heroes of faith, they were pilgrims on a journey. Now here's what he does in chapter 12 because he turns the corner in chapter 12 and he starts addressing the people he was talking to and I'm telling you he's addressing us as well. He starts saying that now it's our turn to walk this journey of faith but he uses a different picture. Look at verse number, uh, chapter 12 verse number 1. He, he, he's talking to us now with, with, with that as the, the, the background of, of, of what's been going on in the book of Hebrews. And historically with this persecution, he says to these these readers in chapter 12, verse 1, and this is what he says to us. Listen to this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Okay? So that's all of these people who've gone before us. That's all the saints who've gone before us. All of them. They're a cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. Listen to what he tells us to do. Let us now lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds." We're going to look at these three verses and then go a little bit further. And I know this was like a really long introduction, but I want to pray right now. And I want to pray that God will help us, okay, um, as, as, we, as we look. Because I, this is what I want you to see. Um, we are now, the, the picture in chapter 11 was a pilgrimage. And all of these faithful people were walking this pilgrimage as, as, as sojourners through a land that wasn't home. Because they, were, they had their eyes fixed on a better city. But then he uses this picture and he says that we've got to run this, we've got to walk this same pilgrimage. But in in chapter 12, he calls it a race. And he calls us all runners in a race. And we've got to be people who endure with our eyes fixed on Jesus so that we don't, here's what he says, so that we don't grow weary. And tonight, what, I'm gonna, what, I, what I want us to look at for the, next, for the next few minutes here is I want us to look at, I think, the clear and present danger of this Christian life that all of us taste of is this, is coming to the place where it is very, very easy for us to get discouraged. Are you discouraged tonight? I, I, want, us, I want us to look at it. Let me, just, let me just pray and ask God to help us. Father, you know that this is a long introduction to bring us here to chapter number 12. But Lord, I pray that you will help us now as we take a few more minutes and we look at this race that we are in. And Lord, what it means to keep our eyes fixed on you. God, would you please help us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
So he says here, and the picture that he gives us of the, of, of the Christian life now is this picture of a race. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And I could, I, I, there's some things I'm just going to kind of move quickly past because I'm not going to be able to handle every nuance. We could talk about the weights that weigh us down. We've got to lay them aside. Um, the sin that besets us, that trips us up. There's lots of sins that we have in our lives. Ultimately, the sin of the book of Hebrews is the sin of unbelief. That's ultimately what he's talking about. But at the core of the sin of unbelief is all of our sin. All of our struggles ultimately come down to we have faith struggles. We don't believe God is enough, so we start going to other things. We don't believe that God really satisfies, so we go towards immorality. We don't believe that God really is who he says he is. So we have our sin struggles always at the core of it is because we have a heart that struggles to really believe. Okay? So... The sin which doth so easily beset us, even though we all have our different expressions of besetting sins, at the core, the sin that besets us is the sin of unbelief. But he says now, we've got to be people who run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, I want to look at this picture. Can I tell you something? I'm not a runner. I love to exercise, but I hate to run. I don't know if you folks are runners. I'm not a runner. If I was going to run, my favorite part about running would be when I was done running. Okay, I just don't love to run. Um, I, I'm like, this is a horrible picture. I mean, give me another picture of the Christian life. Why does it have to be running? But you know what? It's actually a great picture because running is hard for me. And I want you to know something that the Christian life set before us as a race is hard. He tells us to lay aside the weights. No runner shows up on a race day with uh, you know, overalls and combat boots on. No, you, 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 you strip down to the lightest of clothing. And if I was going to race, I mean, I want perfect conditions. I mean, I, I, if I'm going to run, I want like, you know, 65 degrees. That's perfect. Um, I want like super, super lightweight, comfortable clothing. I want nice, you know, comfortable shoes that make it feel like I'm, I'm running on clouds. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, you know, a little wind at my back pushing me along. Downhill, both ways, you know. Um, but did you, I haven't really found that that's what the Christian life is like. I've found that many times a Christian life seems like an, ups, an, an uphill struggle. It's, it's, not a, it's, 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 not a, it's not a 50 yard dash. Folks, this race is not a 50 yard. We could all put something together for 50 yards. This is a marathon. It's not over till you die. And it's okay to collapse on the other side of the finish line. But in the meantime, we've got to be people who persevere. We've got to be people who endure. When he uses the word here, when he uses the word that we must run with patience, it's a great Greek word. The Greek word is hupomeno. And it's a word that actually means to remain under. Okay, so in the midst of this race that's not easy, um, that, that we've got to remain under, we've got to stay under the pressure, stay under the trial, stay under the struggle. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm in the middle of, when I'm in the middle of pressure, I mean, I don't know about you, but I kind of, when pressure's sitting on me, you know what I like to do? I like to get out from under pressure. I like to find a way to get, to, to get out from under it. But the word that he, stay, that he gives us here is stay under it. Why does he tell us to endure? Why does he tell us to stay under the pressure of this race? You know why? Because God's up to something in mind in your life. And he's telling us to stay under it. He says to run with Hupo minnow, remaining under the race that is set before us. Um, you know, if you were going to assign some actors in this picture, the Christian as the runner, and I don't know, the, the part that I would say maybe God plays in the picture of a, ra of a runner, an athlete running a race, um, uh, you know, I suppose it's fair to say that God would take on in this picture the part of a coach. I got a question. Are coaches known for being easy on the athlete? 
Um, I grew up going to a Christian school, and I played sports. I played, I played soccer. I played basketball. I played baseball. I had one particular coach in basketball. He was good. He actually played basketball for the University of North Carolina. Now, he wasn't on the A team. He was on the B team. He was on the practice team, and he, but he played with all the guys back in the... I, back in the 70s, and he was incredible. This, dude, this guy was a phenomenal basketball player, and he wasn't just good at playing the game. He knew how to coach the game, and he was great. And there was a group of us boys. I mean, I mean we, we, we were with him and all the way through, and, and, and he would push us and push us and push us and push us. He used to make us run suicides. You know what a suicide is? He'd make us run something called a suicide. You start at the... At the at the, 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 the end line, you'd run to the foul line, back to the end line, to the half court line, back to the end line, to the other foul line, back to the end line, to the other end line. Do it again! Do it again! I mean, he would push us and push us. He would run us and run us and run us and run us. He called them suicides. We called them homicides because we were pretty sure he was trying to kill us. Um, you know what? Um, there was a group of us boys. We played together from the time I was in the seventh grade all the way through till we were juniors and seniors in high school. And we actually, we had the same coach, and we actually, there was a group of us guys, and we were, we, we were actually really good. We played together, and it was, we played schools that were way bigger than us. We played guys that were way better naturally, physically bigger, stronger. They should have beat us, but we would beat them. We would beat them bad. You want to know why? Because come the fourth quarter, guess what? We could still run. You see, the coach has something in his mind for the athlete. And he wants them to hit it further. He wants them to last longer, to run faster. And so the coach comes into the athlete's life and cares about him, yes, but he pushes him. But in the midst of this picture, in the midst of this marathon of the Christian life, the clear and present danger is that it is easy for us to get discouraged if you skip down to verse number three i'll be back to verse two it's the heart that i want us to see of the matter but look at verse number three he says for consider him now who's him that's jesus for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself and listen to this lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds now right there he gives us a definition of what he means by being discouraged to be wearied and faint in your minds. He's talking about the layered effect that wearies us over time. Have you ever noticed that discouragement never really comes all at one time? Have you ever noticed that discouragement is kind of the layered effect of life struggles? It's the ongoing struggle at work. And then and then that maybe has been lasting for years, and then the financial struggle that's been going on just the past few weeks, and then it was the conversation with your spouse, and next thing you know, any one thing would have been fine, but it's the combination. It's why we have the statement, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. That's silly. Straws don't break a camel's back unless there's a million of them. The point is that a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, we find ourselves being wearied under the, the struggles of this life. We find ourselves really doubting that God really is in control. We find ourselves struggling. Is God really up to what's best for me? I know what my Bible says, and I know what I'm supposed to believe, but I'm just not always feeling it. We show up to church, we wear our smile, amen brother, hey sister, but inside maybe tonight you're doubting that God's really up to good in your life and that he has your absolute best interest at heart. It's easy for us to get discouraged. Did you know that the Old Testament is, the Bible in general, is full of stories about discouraged people? The Bible's full of discouraged people. I mean, uh, I mean just, just think with me. Think about, um, just, just real quick, a cruise through the Bible. Uh, um, the, uh, I mean, think about Cain. I know Cain was hardly an uh, example of Christian 
uh, uh, character. But, but Cain, okay, so he sins and the punishment comes on him and what was his response to God's punishment? He says, it is more than I can bear. I meet a lot of Christians who because of the consequences of past sins, they are under this weight of consequences and they really feel like it is more than they can bear. Folks, sin has hard consequences and there is a danger in the midst of consequences. There's a danger in becoming discouraged. I think about the people of Israel, the children of Israel. They've, they've rebelled against God and now they're meandering. They're meandering. Going through the, the wilderness, going through, I mean, and, and, and they are, they are they, they've lost purpose. They don't even know why they're on this earth. They're discouraged. You know, I meet a lot of Christians who have no clue why they're on this earth. They're meandering. Do you know why you have blood pumping through your veins? If we're not careful, life will be reduced all the way down to, you know, just a few activities a day. Man, we wake up, go to work, come home, eat supper, watch some TV, go to bed. Get up, go to work, come home, eat some supper, watch some TV, go to bed. Get up, go to work, come home, watch some TV. Eat some supper, go to bed. I meet people who have no clue. They call themselves Christians, and I want to believe it with all my heart, but they have no clue why they're on this earth. They've lost purpose. There's a danger in becoming discouraged when you have no clue why you're here. Um, I, think about, I think about, you know, uh, Jonah. You know why Jonah was discouraged? Jonah was discouraged because he didn't know why God was being so kind to wicked people. I meet a lot of Christians who have no, I, they're discouraged in the midst of wondering why God's so kind to their neighbors. Man, it just seems like everything goes well. Or that guy, he, he's, he's only been working there five years. I've been working there 15. And he gets the promotion? I mean, you even know what, what he says about the boss in the break room. Really, God? You're going to give it to him. There's a danger in becoming discouraged. You know, I think about Elijah. You know why Elijah was discouraged? It's because he had unfulfilled expectations. He's up on top of the mountain. Man, the prophets of Baal are slain. He's on, I mean, he's on cloud nine. You know what he's ready for? He's ready for national revival. Took one woman, Jezebel. She said, I want him dead. All of a sudden, we have this man after this great victory. And what is he doing? He's running. He's hiding. And then he has a woe is me pity party. And, 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 he, and he, starts, he starts the all alone syndrome. I'm the only one who's still standing. I'm the only one. And actually God comes to him after a while, gives him a little time. And God comes to him and says, actually, um, Elijah, there's 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You're, you're not alone. Okay, I've given you time to rest. Now get up, let's go. Folks, he was discouraged. There's a danger in becoming discouraged. I think about Job. Why was Job discouraged? I mean, what else, God? What else could go wrong? What else are you going to take? What other trial am I going to have to face? I love his resolve. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But in the middle of it, he's just discouraged. Are you discouraged tonight? Um, uh, Leah, I, I love this story. Leah, a, she had a sister. Her name was Rachel, okay? Um, the uh, problem number one is that both sisters married the same man. That's just not going to work, all right? Um, so, but then here, here, here's how the story goes. Rachel, her sister, was beautiful. Leah, eh, not so. So who did, so who did, the hus so who did Jacob love? Well, he loved, he loved Rachel. He didn't love Leah. And so, but then Rachel couldn't have children. Leah could. And so Leah started to name her children names that were crying the discouragement of her heart. You know what she wanted? She named her children names. It was clear. She named her children names that would mean things like this. Now my husband will love me. Now my husband will be joined to me now that I have now bore him another son. And as she bore children, she named them names out of her heart. She just wanted her husband to love her who doesn't. But here's the point. What if the person who you want to love you more than anybody else on the face of the planet never does? There's a danger in becoming discouraged. This race 
that is set before us. We have never been promised that this race is going to be easy. And, and I, I want you to see what he does, starting in verse number five. Starting in verse number five, he tells us something that these people know. It's something that we all know. He tells us in verse number five, listen to what he says. He says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, listen to what he does. He says in verse number, in verse number five, he says, you have forgotten something. And it's something that we tend to forget in the midst of the struggles of this life, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the pressure. He said, you have forgotten something. And let me, let me go back to, my, to my, uh, my story about Coach. Okay, so Coach was tough on us. Coach would push us. And it was hard love. We knew he loved us, but it was hard love because he wanted us to be good. And you know, there was a kid on our team we all struggled with. There was a kid we all struggled with. You know why? He was coach's favorite. He was good. He was really good. He, he was easily probably the, the best of all of us. But it was obvious that he was coach's favorite. He got more sideline talks. Um, he, got, he, got, he got probably a little more pressure put on him by coach. And it was just obvious. I mean, coach loved all of us, but it was obvious coach loved him more. And we, we all kind of struggled just a little bit with this kid. You know why coach was, he was coach's favorite? He wasn't just this kid's coach. He was this kid's dad. It was coach's son was on my team. You know what he just said in verse number five that we tend to forget? In the midst of the trials, and this is so important, he's not just our coach. He's our father. And there is nothing that touches you in this race. Nothing that touches you. That first doesn't come through the father filtered hands of God who loves you more than you have, than you could ever believe and ever understand. He loves us. And he uses a word here that's a hard word for us. It's a hard word. It's, it's the program of the Christian life. If I was going to kind of, my points would be the picture of the Christian life, this race. And then here, secondly, is the program of the Christian life. It's all wrapped up in a hard word for us. What's the word? We find it there in verse number five. My son, despise not thou the what? Chastening. You know why this is a hard word for us is because I actually think that the way this, what this word actually means and the way that we have it coming out right here is a little bit hard. It's, it's, there's, there's a little bit of a disconnect because when you hear the word chastening, what do you think? What do you say? Punishment. When we hear the word chastening, we think punishment. So if that's true, then this is what it's saying. Hey, you stay in this race. You keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. We'll get to that in just a minute. I know, I know you're discouraged and all this stuff, but, but, but God's punishing you, and you've got to stay under it. But folks, I want you to know something. The word, the word chastening is not a word that means punishment. Now, sometimes it does. Listen to what the word chastening is. It's a word that simply means the raising of children. The rearing of a child, that's what the word itself actually means. And so, um, does that ever involve punishment? Yeah, it does in my trailer. But it's more than just punishment. It's, it's child rearing. It's, it's a time encouraging. It's in time teaching. It's instructing. It's the whole gamut of raising children. And here, assuming the picture of a good father... He says, you've all had fathers who, who, who chastened you, raised you, and maybe they, they, they weren't perfect. But they were, they, were, they were raising you as best they knew. And at times, yes, there was punishment. He even says, at times, they're scourging. But the bottom line is that we have a father who is raising us. And he loves us. And so the the, the program of this Christian life has to be seen through an understanding of this word chastening. But then what is the, 
What is the product? What is he after? Look at what it says. Look down at verse number 10. He says, for they, talking about your earthly fathers, um, he uses as a picture um, our earthly fathers. He says, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, and that phrase means as they knew best, as they thought best, your fathers chastened you. But he says, but he, listen why he is chastening us, raising us for our profit, our benefit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. He says, verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous, but listen what God's up to. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. He brings up three things that God's up to. First of all, he says, this is for your benefit, your profit. God is doing what's best in my life. Second of all, he says that, that, that he is, is growing, or that he is creating in us, growing in us, his holiness. And he's growing in us the peaceable fruits of his righteousness. In other words, God is allowing pressure. God is bringing sometimes struggle. God is allowing this because God is in the process of growing me in you. And he's saying, stop trying to get out from under what this coach is doing, what your father is doing. Stay under it. Um, let me give you an illustration, and then we'll wrap this up. I'll never forget my daughter. Uh, she's she's uh, been, been, been here today. She's my 11, getting ready to turn 12-year-old. But I remember all the way back when she was one, almost two years old, one and a half. It was Easter Sunday. We were at a church just outside of Lansing, Michigan. And I remember, I remember my daughter um, coming upstairs from the nursery. It was Easter Sunday. Uh, the, the service was over. And I was standing in the back with the pastor. And my daughter comes up from the nursery. And somebody in the nursery has given my daughter as a little Easter present a, a, a Easter bunny Pez dispenser. And she has this little thing, and she's coming up. She's like, da, 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 da. She's, you know, waddling over to me, barely, barely, uh, you know, able to, uh, able to run. But she comes up to me. Now, she knows that there's some kind of little toy here, but she knows there's candy. And my daughter's love language was definitely sugar at that time. And so she comes over, and she has this thing. And, you know, she's cute, and everybody's kind of standing around. They're like, oh, she's so cute. So I, I, mean, I got down, and I started opening it up, and I was going to give her a piece of candy. But I got all these candy. And I, I, so I'm just like, you know what? Let me just go ahead and stick them in the Pez dispenser real fast. You understand a Pez dispenser. I get them all in there. I got, I, you know, she's watching every step. But when I'm done, she sees the toy. She sees the empty wrapper. She doesn't see the candy. Now, I got the head pulled back, a piece of candy sticking out. But she doesn't see it, and as far as she's concerned, Daddy's taking away the candy. The candy's gone. And I mean, folks, I mean, she just blows up. I mean, she just blows up. I'm talking, she's on the floor. She's kicking and screaming. We're talking weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. It was bad. You know, all these people who were just talking about how cute she is, now they're going, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I mean, it was so bad. I had to pick her up. I scooped her up. I took her into the pastor's office. I'm trying to reason with my one-and-a-half-year-old. It's not working. You know, I finally, I finally get her calmed down. I got the head pulled back, a piece of candy sticking out. I help her. I take her little fingers, and I show her, and we pull one out, and she looks at it. And she sticks it in her mouth, and she looks at me with a little look that was like, Oh, <laughs> You were just trying to give me a piece of candy. Okay, I'm good. And can I tell you something? I sat there. I sat there in that, in that office. Okay, this was Easter sun, sun, uh, Sunday 10 years ago. And I'm sitting there with my daughter after that morning service in the middle of Michigan, just outside of Lansing, and I just lose it. I just start weeping. You know why? Because God, God used that little picture right there, and he just hammered me. Because I was right in the middle of going through the biggest trial of my life. And I didn't, I, I, I didn't believe God was doing what was right. I was struggling. 
I, 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 I felt like God was in the midst of running his universe that he had, I mean, just the details. It's like, I mean, I was just right in the middle of pressure, struggle. I'm, I'm trying to serve him. And I'm just, you know, it's just in one of those seasons where you're like, God, I mean, I'm doing this for you. Why, why I mean, what? And God used that little situation where my daughter, she didn't trust me that I was up to good. And I got a question for you. Um, Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you were in the middle of a struggle where you actually really believe that God is withholding something good from you. Because that's what I believed about God and that's what my daughter believed about me. She thought that I was withholding something good from her. Or maybe on a flip side, you would say that maybe your struggle is that you actually believe that God has allowed something that's bad. It's not good. And folks, I'm not saying that God's God's packages are always taste good, feel good. They aren't. But do you believe that God is up to good? And that no matter what's going on in your life, that God's up to good. You, you, you say, Aaron, you mean to tell me that the trial that's going on right now in my life is actually something that's coming through the hands of a, of, of, of a loving father who loves me and that it's actually something he's gonna use for good and I need to stay under it? Yeah. You mean to tell me that this financial crisis right now is actually something that God has allowed for my good? I mean, yeah. Um, Folks, God's hand is all over the details of your life. And I'm sure in the middle of it, it's really, really hard to see. It is for me. But we got to stop trying to get out from under. We got to stay under, stay in this race. Because as a coach, yes, but more importantly, as a father, he is working in me and you the peaceable fruits of his righteousness. You say, Aaron, I'm discouraged. What what, what, what do I got to do? Well, look at verse number 12 and 13. Look at verse 12 and 13. He says, Verse number 12 and 13, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. You know what he says? He says, hey, this is a hard race and we get sore, we get down, we feel beat up, but you know what? We've got to get back up and, and stay in this race. Lift up those hands which hang down. Strengthen those feeble knees. And you can't do it on your own. You say, Aaron, how do I do this? How do I lift up these hands? I'm so weary. How do I strengthen these feeble knees? I'm so discouraged. Well, I want to go back to the first phrase of both Verse 2 and verse 3. What does he tell us to do? He says, this is how we run this race. Looking unto Jesus. Verse number 3, the first phrase, you ready? Consider him. Folks, what does it mean when it says to, to look at Jesus? It's not talking about in the midst of this race that we take a quick glance at Jesus every once in a while. This is a phrase, and then in verse number three, when it says consider him, it's talking about examine him. Fix, it is a fixation of your eyes. He's going, this this is going back to chapter number 11. You want to know how it is that we live this life of faith? We can't see him now with physical eyes. We see all the struggles. With eyes of faith, we fix our gaze on him. Every day of your life. Can I tell you what this, can I tell you something, folks? In order to get through the trials of this life, you can't, 
You can't just see Jesus once a week on Sunday morning when pastor preaches. Let me get my eyes on Jesus fixed and then I can cruise on through the life. No, this is all day, every day our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus. It is the gaze of our heart and our life be thou my vision, O oh Lord, of my heart. It, the Christian life can only be lived with a lifelong fixation and stare at Jesus. Why? What's, I mean, what's the big deal? Why do we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus? Why do we turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his glorious face, why is it only then that the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace? Why is it that we are told and we have to live our life with our spiritual gaze fixed on him? Well, well listen to what verse 2 says. It says, looking unto Jesus, fixing your gaze upon Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. And where is he now? Listen to what it says about him. He endured the cross look, look at verse number two looking unto jesus the author and the joy i mean and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him he endured you see that word endured you know what that word is hupo minnow he stayed under same word he he endured he stayed under the cross and now where is he he despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Folks, do you understand that Jesus Christ is set down at the right hand of the throne of God? Where is Jesus right now? Jesus Christ was crucified. On the third day, he rose again. He was on this earth for 40 days. He was seen of over 500 witnesses. He ascends up into heaven. He gives before he leaves the great commission. He ascends up into heaven and he sits down. And I don't know if you have ever fully thought about and taken in how important it is for you that your Savior Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of God on the other side of the finish line. But I want you to know something, folks. There are tons of applications as to why that is so important for you. He finished this race. And he didn't just finish it for himself. He finished it for me and you. The fact that he is seated beside the, the right hand of God means that we have access to the Father through him. Everything that we find throughout the Bible, especially in Paul's epistles about who we are in Christ, we are seated in the heavenlies. We are beloved. Folks, we are, I know your pastor's working through the book of Ephesians. I mean, we are, we, we are redeemed. We are adopted. We have been chosen. Try to wrap your brain around that. You just got to take it at face value. Folks, we are in Christ. We have access to the Father through Christ. And he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And you know what it means? It means no matter how hard this race is going to get, I'm going to make it because he's already made it for me. Folks, we're going to make it. And so as we go through the trials of this life, as you go through broken relationships, as you go through financial crisis, as you go through cancer, we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who is seated on the other side of the finish line. And can I just tell you something, folks? I'm just going to be really, really honest with you. There's only one way that you're really going to be able to do this. The only way that we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus is to behold him in the very place where he has most revealed himself. We got to be in this book. This is how you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You've got to read it. You've got to then not just read it because there's a lot of people who read to check it off the list but don't really take it to heart. 
You've got to meditate on this Jesus. We've got to know this Jesus. We've got to stare at this Jesus. We've got to behold this Jesus. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on him. Because this life is hard. He's the only one. Did you know Jesus Christ is the only one who knows your pain? You, we, 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 in the midst of our trials, we run to our confidants. We run to our, our friends. We, I run to my dad. My dad is someone who I look to and talk to. And it's fine. We have our counselors. It's fine. But folks, Jesus Christ is the only one who knows. Jesus Christ knows pain. Jesus Christ knew suffering. Jesus Christ knew rejection. It, he knew pressure. It was physical. It was emotional. It was spiritual. It came from family. It came from friends. It came from enemies. He knew it all. And can I tell you something that happened to Jesus that'll never happen to me and you? In his dying moments, in his dying moment, his father turned his back on him. That'll never happen to me. Jesus knows our suffering. And folks, if we're going to live this Christian life, we've got to live it with our eyes fixed on him. Are you discouraged today? Do you need to turn your eyes upon Jesus? Do you need to look full in his wonderful face with eyes of faith? Folks, that is the only way. That is the only way that we can make it. I'm telling you, this Christian life, I mean, I got saved at 21, and I mean, I, I was on cloud nine. I mean, I'm just serving the Lord. I mean, I just wanted to give him everything. And then, and then I, had, I, I, just, I started to have some seasons. I came back down to the real, to earth. And, and, and I don't know about you, but my Christian life, I feel like it's roller coasters. The highs and the lows, the mountaintops, the valleys. Sometimes it just seems like it's, everything's going great. At other times, it just seems so hard. And I think when I came into my Christian life, I had this, this, this wrong understanding of, man, you give your life to Jesus, and it's just a downhill slide all the way till you get to glory. It's not how it is, folks. Many, many times, this Christian life, it's an uphill struggle. It's, it's, it's not sunny, it's raining, it's not, it's not nice, it's cold. It's um, the, the shoes on your feet are worn out, the blisters are real, and the people on the sidelines aren't fans telling you they're awesome, it's the world telling you you're stupid. And we've got to be people who have spiritual eyes that are fixated on the end of this story. Where Jesus Christ is seated. He is seated, having accomplished our ultimate salvation. Folks, we're going to make it. We are going to make it. Um, do you have your eyes fixed on Jesus? You know what I need tomorrow morning? You know what I need tomorrow morning? I need to get out of bed, and I need to fix my eyes on Jesus again tomorrow. You know what I need to do on Tuesday morning? I need to get out of bed and I need to refix my eyes on Jesus. You know what I need to do on Wednesday morning? Same thing. Folks, so many Christians, they got church life, then they got like real life. You live real life and you struggle all week, you show up on Sunday and get your Jesus fix. Mm -mm. Jesus Christ has got to be the one who fills your vision throughout all of life. Do you believe that God is intimately, intricately involved in the details of your life? Do you believe that what's going on in your life right now is according to his perfect plan for you? Folks, we gotta believe that. And we gotta stay under it. Stop trying to get out from under what God's doing. Stay under. Are you discouraged today? Um, my, my, my prayer would be that you would be encouraged as you think about, uh, think about Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's accomplished for you. May, may, may God strengthen us 
and encourage us. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed.